like to welcome you to this lecture on Bitcoin keys and addresses. Uh, this is part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. So our agenda is we're going to dive into cryptography and understanding private key and public key from a Bitcoin perspective. Uh, then we'll take a look at the particular asymmetric cryptography algorithm that Bitcoin uses, which is elliptic curve cryptography or UCC. Uh, then we'll talk about Bitcoin addresses and the relationship between addresses and the public and private keys. Um, finally, we'll dive into some advanced key and address topics, and we'll take a look at paper wallets. Uh, in our next lecture, we'll cover other types of wallets, you know, hardware wallets and software wallets. So Bitcoin is based on cryptography, which is a branch of mathematics used extensively in computer security. Uh, cryptography means uh, secret writing in Greek, but the science of cryptography encompasses more than just secret writing, which we typically refer to as encryption these days. Uh, cryptography can also be used to prove knowledge of a secret about revealing that secret, uh, for example, digital signatures, or prove the authenticity of data, for example, like a digital fingerprint. Uh, these types of cryptographic proofs are the mathematical tools that are critical to Bitcoin and used extensively in Bitcoin applications and in other cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, encryption is not a, that important a part of Bitcoin as all of our information, transaction data, communications, and so on are public as part of the blockchain and don't need to be encrypted to protect the currency. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about some of the different aspects of cryptography used in Bitcoin to control ownership of funds in the form of keys, addresses, and wallets. Uh, so ownership of Bitcoin is established through digital keys, uh, Bitcoin addresses, and digital signatures. The digital keys are not actually stored in the network, but are instead created and stored by users in a file or a database, which is often referred to as a wallet. Uh, the digital keys in a user's wallet are completely independent of the Bitcoin protocol and can be generated and managed by the user's wallet software without reference to the blockchain or access to the internet even. Uh, keys enable many interesting properties of Bitcoin, uh, including decentralized trust and control, ownership attestation, and a cryptographic proof uh, security model. Most Bitcoin uh, transactions will require a valid digital signature uh, to transfer the, the cryptocurrency on the blockchain. And that valid digital signature can only be generated using a secret key. Uh, therefore, anyone with a copy of that secret key has the ability to control that Bitcoin and transfer it. The digital signature used to spend funds is, can also be referred to as a witness, uh, which is a term used in cryptography. The witness state in a Bitcoin transaction testifies to who is the true owner of the funds being spent. Uh, the keys come in pairs, consisting of a private key or a secret key, and the other key is a public key. Think of the public key as similar to a bank account number and the private key as similar to a secret password or PIN or the, or the signature on a check that provides control over the account. Uh, these keys are for the most part rarely seen by the users of Bitcoin, for the most part, they're stored inside the wallet and managed by the wallet software. In the payment portion of a Bitcoin transaction, the recipient's public key is represented by its digital fingerprint, called a Bitcoin address, which is used in the same way as the beneficiary name on a check, for example, pay to the order of. In most cases, a Bitcoin address is generated from and corresponds to a public key, However, not all Bitcoin addresses represent public keys. They can also represent other beneficiaries such as scripts, which we'll talk about later. This way, Bitcoin addresses abstract the recipient of funds, making the transaction destination flexible, similar to paper checks. A single payment instru instrument can be used to pay into people's accounts, pay into company accounts, pay for bills, or pay to cash. The Bitcoin address is the only representation of the keys that users will routinely see because this is a the part they need to share with the world so that they can get paid. Um, so first we're gonna cover the cryptography and explain the mathematics used in Bitcoin. Then we'll look at how keys are generated, stored and managed. We're gonna review the different encoding formats used to represent 
uh, private keys, public keys, addresses, and script addresses. Finally, we'll take a quick look at advanced uses of keys and addresses, uh, like vanity addresses, multi-signatures, script addresses, and paper wallets. So let's talk a little about cryptography. Uh, there's multiple different types of cryptography. Symmetric encryption is where both parties have uh, the same shared secret key. So for example, let's suppose Alice wants to send a message to Bob and she wants to tell Bob that she really likes Bitcoin. So she has her message, I really like Bitcoin, uh, but she doesn't want anyone else to know. So she encrypts that message. Uh, in this particular case, it's symmetric encryption, so she's using a shared secret key. And the output of that encryption is uh, what we'll call a ciphertext. It's the message, I really like Bitcoin, but it's been you know, manipulated so you, no one else can read it except someone who has a copy of the shared secret key. When Bob receives a message, he uses his shared secret key to decrypt the message, and he can now read the message that Ellis really likes Bitcoin. So that's symmetric encryption. Um, and an example of symmetric encryption um, is, for example, AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And there are other standards of cryptographic libraries that are based on symmetric encryption. But the basic idea is both parties have to have a copy of that shared secret key. Um, and if the attacker can get a copy of it, then the attacker can read the message. And so one of the questions you might ask is, well, how does Bob or anyone else who's supposed to read the message get a copy of the shared secret key from Alice without letting the hacker get a copy of it? Asymmetric encryption is a little bit different. In asymmetric encryption, both parties have a copy of the message. So in this case, again, Alice, I'm sorry, both parties have their own uh, public and private keys that they're gonna be using when they're trying to read the message. So let's explain how this works. Uh, this is a very different approach and it solves the problem of how do you deal with, you know, in the shared secret key, how do you give uh, Bob a copy of the shared secret key without the hacker getting a copy of it? So in this particular case, Alice still wants to send a message to Bob saying, hey, I really like Bitcoin. Um, so she takes her message, she encrypts it, but this time Bob has two keys. He's got a secret key that only he knows uh, and he doesn't expose it to others. And then he's got a public key that he broadcasts to the world. And so Alice takes the message, I really like Bitcoin, and she sends that message to Bob, but before she sends a message to Bob, she's gonna encrypt it using Bob's public key. And when she encrypts it using Bob's public key, she'll get some secret message that's hard to read by anyone who doesn't have the key to decode it. And once it's decoded by Bob's public key, the only key that can decode it is Bob's secret key. So this is a pair. Uh, the public key and the private key work together. And once you encode something with the public key, only the private key can decode it or the secret key. Um, and so Bob can now read the message saying, oh, Alice really likes Bitcoin. And Bob knows that uh, no, Bob and Alice both know that a hacker could not have read that message. So that's the basic idea behind these key pairs in asymmetric encryption. So public key cryptography was invented in the 1970s. And it's a mathematical foundation for computer and information security. Uh, many of our technologies that we know rely on on the internet today rely on public key cryptography. Uh, since the invention of public key cryptography, several suitable mathematical functions such as prime number explementation and elliptic curve math multiplication have been discovered. These uh, mathematical functions are practically irreversible, meaning that they're easy to calculate one direction and extremely difficult to the point of being infeasible to calculate in the opposite direction. Based on these mathematical functions, cryptography enables the creation of digital secrets and unforgeable digital signatures. Bitcoin uses elliptic curve multiplication as a basis for its cryptography. Um, in Bitcoin, we use public key cryptography to create a key pair that controls access to the Bitcoin. The key pair consists of a private key and derive from it a unique public key. The public key is used to receive funds, 
and the private key is used to sign transactions to spend the funds. There is a mathematical relationship between the public key and the private key that allows the private key to be used to generate signatures on messages. Those signatures can then be validated against the public key without revealing the private key. So when spending Bitcoin, the current owner of the Bitcoin presents his or her public key and the digital signature. That digital signature is different each time it's computed on the transaction uh, to spend those Bitcoins. Through the presentation of the public key and the signature, everyone in the Bitcoin network can verify and accept the transactions as valid, confirming that the person transferring the Bitcoin owned those Bitcoin at the time of the transfer. Uh, in most wallet implementations, the private and public keys are gonna be stored together as a key pair for convenience. However, the public key can be calculated from the private key. So you could potentially also just store the private key and com compute the pu public key when you need it. So as I mentioned, public key, private key dates back uh, a number of years. Um, the first public announcement of public key, private key evolution was uh, by Diffie Hellman in 1976. But actually seven years before that, British intelligence had discovered key pairs, but they took a couple decades before they revealed publicly that they had discovered it. In 1977, the RSA algorithm came along uh, that made use of public key, private key. Elliptic curve cryptography, which Bitcoin uses, uh, came along in 1985. And there's currently ongoing work on quantum resistant key pairs. Um, Elliptic curve cryptography algorithms entered wide usage in 2005, primarily because they were faster and more efficient than Diffie-Hellman and RSA. So here's a look at how you would use public key, private key for digital signatures. Earlier, I talked about using it for encryption. So when you want to use a digital signature, what you're trying to do is you're trying to prove who the message came from. So in this particular case, instead of Alice sending the, Alice might still be sending this message, I really like Bitcoin, but now she wants Bob to know that this message absolutely came from Alice and it didn't come from a hacker. So the way Alice proves that the message came from her is she signs the message using her private key. And then she publishes her public key to the world. And so Bob can use her public key to verify that this message came from Alice. And so as long as Alice keeps her private key or secret key safe and doesn't expose it to others, only Alice is going to be able to send these signed messages and anyone will be able to verify that that message in fact came from Alice. Now you may ask the question is, if Bob is verifying that the public key, uh, you know, is using Alice's public key to verify that the message came from Alice, what if a hacker substituted uh, the hacker's public key for Alice's public key? Then couldn't the hacker impersonate Alice? Well, the way we defeat that problem is through trusted certificate authorities. Uh, trusted certificate authorities certifies that a public key belonged to a particular person. And therefore, as long as we trust that certificate authority, we know that the public key hasn't been substituted. So hashes are another cryptography technology that we're gonna be talking about in a little bit. Um, hashes basically take any size string as an input. Uh, it could be terabytes in size, um, and then they allow you to have a fixed size output. So for example, if you're using SHA-256, you get a fixed size output of 256 bits. Um, and hashes are, are basically considered a one-way algorithm. Um, you know, it's very easy to compute um, the input and produce the output of the hash, but it's very hard to take that hash and then go back to the original input. And furthermore, um, they're meant to be uh, collision free in that, um, you know, it, there may be collisions, but it's very hard to find those collisions. Um, and so if you find two hash values that are identical, then you can assume that the inputs are identical. Um, and so there's a couple of advantages that we get from using hashes. Um, you know, one, 
way that you have to use very commonly on the internet is as message digests or file, file signatures. Um, to recognize a file that you saw before, you can just store the hash of the file. The hash is much smaller than the file. And then what you can do is if you wanna verify that the file hasn't changed, you just recompute the hash of the file and compare the computed hash to the stored hash. If the two hashes are equal, then the file has been modified. If the two hashes do not match, then you know that the file's been modified. And it's very efficient to store a hash because the size of the hash can be very small compared to a file size which could be terabytes or even larger. So here's a couple examples of using SHA-256. I'm gonna take a look at a hash calculator. Um, so let's go take a look at that. So here we've got a hash calculator, uh, it's on exorbin.com. Um, and basically we pipe in some data string and this data string could be gigabytes or terabytes. I just chose one word. And then you see down here a hash for it, um, which is in hexadecimal format, which is zero through nine and A through F. Um, and it's, and it's, it's roughly um, 256 bits, which would be approximately 64 of these characters. Uh, but let's suppose we wanna change this and we want to put in another hash. We wanna put in hash, we'll see what the hash for Bitcoin one is. The hash for Bitcoin started out with six B, 88C0. Let's see what Bitcoin One reads. Bitcoin One reads DBDBAC. Uh, let's try Bitcoin Two. That one's 1ED72. We'll try Bitcoin Three. Uh, that one is 0C55, and so on. And so you can see, um, you know, it's very hard to look at this 0C55 and figure out that the original input was Bitcoin Three. So going backwards in a hash is gonna be extremely difficult. But let's suppose, for example, that uh, I'm a fan of James Bond and I would like to see um, this hash begin with not just one zero, but I'd like to see this hash begin with zero, zero, seven. Um, well, I mean, I could try, you know, just typing in Bitcoin four, that just got me zero A, well, that's not bad. Try Bitcoin five, uh, that got me DE. Uh, let's yeah, so you know we switched from a couple zeros to a DE. Let's try uh, let's try James Bond. See if that does anything here. Nope. Uh, let's try 007. Nope. So how do I get 007 to begin this? Well, the way I would do it is I would just keep typing in uh, multiple uh, inputs until at some point we end up with an output that begins with 007. So you could call this sort of a brute force approach. Uh, that's how I would end up with, you know, just try many, many alternatives. So if we remember, the output is gonna be hexadecimal, zero to nine, eight through F. That, so that's uh, essentially 16 options. So to get a specific output that begins with 007, it would be uh, 16 times 16 times 16, or approximately 4,000 hashes that I would have to run on average before I would get that output of 007. Now, since it's random, it could make, take only two computations, it could take 8,000, but you know, roughly on average, it would take about 4,000 computations to get something that begins with 007. Now, we'll talk later in another lecture about Bitcoin proof of work, but Bitcoin proof of work is essentially using hashing to do something similar to trying to brute force my example of a 007 output. Um, so basically, Bitcoin proof of work is looking for an output target that begins with four or more zeros. And the number, exact number of zeros is gonna be based on the current target difficulty. Uh, but basically every additional zero increases the number of computations exponentially to find a solution. So for ex example, if you were gonna find a hexadecimal output that begins with four zeros, that would take something like 64,000 hashes on average to find it. Um, and if we're gonna go to, you know, five or six or seven zeros, again, it would increase it uh, by about even further. Um, so it gives you an idea of just how Bitcoin proof of work works, but we'll be taking a much more detailed look at it in a subsequent lecture. So a Bitcoin wallet contains a collection of key pairs, each consisting of a private key and a public key. 
The private key, uh, which I'm showing in this diagram with small lowercase k, is a number usually picked at random. From the private key, we're then going to use elliptic curve multiplication, which is a one-way cryptographic function to generate a public key k, which is our capital K. Uh, from the public key, well, then we're going to use a one-way cryptographic hash function to generate a Bitcoin address. Um, and then, so we're going to talk about how we generate the private key, look at the elliptic curve math that is used to turn that into a public key, and then generate a Bitcoin address from the public key. Um, and so the relationship between your private key, your public key, and your Bitcoin address is shown in this diagram. Um, and we've got an arrow through um, going backwards because Given a Bitcoin address, it's very difficult to compute the public key because hashing is one way. And given the big public key, it's very difficult to commute, compute the private key because elliptic curve multiplication is also one way. And so it's easy to go in this one direction from the private key to the public key to the address. And it's virtually impossible to go in the other direction from the address to the public key to the private key. Now I say virtually impossible or you know very difficult uh, basically, it's not likely to happen in our lifetimes. Um, at, at some point in the future, um, you know, these computer algorithms may be broken by new computers, uh, new technology, new algorithms, and so on. But under today's technology, it is not possible to do it in our lifetimes. So why use... Um, asymmetric cryptography in Bitcoin? Um, well, we're using it because we want to uh, create digital signatures, because we're going to use those, uh, the private keys to create these digital fingerprints of the transactions uh, and produce what, this, what we're going to call this numerical digital signature. The signature can only be produced by someone who has the private key, uh, but anyone with access to the public key and the transaction fingerprint can then use it to verify the digital signature. This uh, property of asymmetric cryptography makes it possible for us to verify every digital signature on every transaction, thereby ensuring that only the owners of the public keys can produce valid signatures and spend the Bitcoin. So a private key is simply a number picked at random. Uh, ownership and control over the private key is the root of user control over all the funds associated with the corresponding Bitcoin address. The private key is used to create signatures that are required to spend Bitcoin by proving ownership of funds using a transaction. The private key should remain secret or private at all times because revealing it to third parties is equivalent to giving them control over the Bitcoin that's secured by that key. The private key should also be backed up and protected from accidental loss because if it's lost, it can't be recovered and the funds secured by it are going to be lost too. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a subsequent lecture, how to back it up. Um, the Bitcoin private key is just a number. You could pick your Bitcoin private keys randomly using just a coin, paper, paper and pencil, you know, toss in a coin 256 times until you have uh, the 256 binary digits or random private key. Uh, the public key could then be computed from that private key. Um, but the first and most important step in generating a private key is to find a secure source of randomness, sometimes referred to as entropy. Uh, creating a Bitcoin key is essentially the same as picking a number between one and two, two to the 256 power. Uh, the exact method used to pick that number doesn't matter as long as it's not predictable or repeatable. Uh, Bitcoin software uses the underlying operating systems, random number generators to produce 256 bits of entropy. Um, usually the operating system random number generator is initialized by a human source of randomness, which is why you may be asked uh, to do various things to generate some entropy. Um, more precisely, the private key can be any number between zero and n minus one, where n is a constant of uh, 1.1578 times 10 to the 77th, which is slightly less than 2 to the 256. And this is defined as the order of the elliptic curve used in Bitcoin. Uh, to create such a key, we ran randomly pick a 256-bit number and check that it's less than n. In programming terms, this is usually achieved by feeding a larger string of random bits uh, corrected, collected from a crypto cryptographically secure source of randomness 
into the SHA-256 hash algorithm, which will then produce a 256-bit number. If the result is less than n, then they have a suitable private key. Otherwise, they simply try again with another random number. So one thing to keep in mind is you should not write your own software code to create a random number or use a simple random number generator offered by a programming language. Instead, use a cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator with a seed from a source of sufficient randomness or entropy. Um, you, know, you want to study the documentation or random number generator library to make sure it's cryptographically secure. Uh, a correct implementation of a pseudo random number generator is critical to security of keys. So here's an example of a randomly generated private key shown in hexadecimal format with 256 bits uh, shown as 64 hexadecimal digits. Uh, again, each of these hexadecimal digits, uh, because it has 16 values, is the equivalent of four bits. Now the size of Bitcoin's private key space, which is two to the 256, is a really large number. It's approximately 10 to 77. Uh, for comparison, the visible universe has like 10 to the 80 atoms. So it's almost as large as the number of atoms in the universe. Um, now you can generate keys using the Bitcoin core client that, that we took a look at in a previous lecture, um, using things, uh, and you can actually view the keys you've created. Um, so how you would do that, you can use things like command, like for get new address or dump private key and so on. I'm not going to go through those examples right now. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about how we can generate our public key. So once you've created your private key, uh, the next step is to compute a public key from that private key. So the private, the public key is calculated from the private key using elliptic curve multiplication, which is uh, extremely difficult to reverse, so we'll call it irreversible. Um, and basically the pr approach is using this formula that I show here in the middle of the slide, where I've got K is a lowercase private key, uh, G is a constant point called a generator point, and when you multiply, uh, the private key times the generator point, you get capital K, which is our resulting public key. Um, and this is a type, this elliptic curve multiplication is a type of function that cryptographers call one way function because it's easy to do in one direction and virtually impossible to do in the reverse direction. The reverse direction is often known is described as finding the discrete logarithm, uh, you know, calculating small k if you know big k, and it's as difficult to tr as trying all possible values of small k. Essentially, you're supposed to, the only way you're supposed to be able to do this is performing a brute force search, um, which would take a very long time. Um, however, the owner of a private key can easily create the public key and share it with the world. Therefore, knowing that no one will be able to reverse the function and calculate the private key from the public key. Uh, and this mathematical trick becomes the basis for unforgeable and secure digital signatures that prove ownership of Bitcoin funds. So elliptic curve cryptography is a type of asymmetric or public key cryptography based on the discrete log program pro problem as expressed by addition and multiplication on the points of an elliptic curve. So here's an example of what an elliptic curve looks like, uh, similar to that used by Bitcoin. Um, so you can think of this as, you know, similar to some curves you've seen in, in geometry, but a basic e example of what a formula might be for something like this curve is y squared equals x cubed plus seven. Um, And you notice when you look at this curve that um, you know, you've got the x-axis and the curve is around the x-axis, but the positive y values and the negative y values are, uh, look like reflections of each other. So for example, um, you know, if a particular point on the x-axis, let's say x equals one, there are two corresponding y values. There's a positive y value that corresponds to x equals one, and there's a negative y value 
that corresponds to x equals one. So Bitcoin uses a specific elliptic curve and set of mathematical constants that are defined in a standard from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, which is referred to as SECP 256K1. Uh, and the curve they're using is y squared equals x cubed plus seven. And this curve is over a finite field of prime order P, which is written by the equation they have down there, which is a very large prime number. Uh, P to the 256 minus two to the 32 minus two to the nine minus two to the eighth and, and so on. Because this curve is defined over a finite field of prime order instead of over the real numbers, it looks like a pattern of dots scattered in several different direction, dimensions, uh, which makes it very difficult to visualize two dimensions. Uh, however, the math is very similar to an elliptic curve over real numbers. Um, and so that's why we're using the elliptic curve here. Um, so here we see the reflections between the positive and negative numbers uh, on the y axis for the y values when we're reflecting over the x axis. So how are we going to generate uh, a public key? So basically, we start with our private key, which is some randomly generated number k. We're going to multiply it by some point on the curve called a generator point, which we're just going to call g here. So let's take g over here, which is in our upper left. That's going to be our generator point. And we're going to multiply it by whatever our number is for our randomly generated k. And then once you multiply it, that will move you to somewhere else on the curve. And that other spot on the curve is going to be our capital K. Um, now, the generator point is going to be the same for all Bitcoin users. So really, it's just, so we're going to use the same generator point for everyone. And so the real question then is, is, what is your private k, k, small case k, because that small case k times g is gonna result in capital K. Um, uh, so here, for example, let's suppose that, um, let's suppose our small case k is two. So if we're multiplying g times two, we end up down here at the bottom of this curve where it says 2G. And then that would be your public key down there. Um, if G was, if k, small k was negative two, then it would be over here, um, you know, and four and eight and negative eight and so on. Um, now, obviously, some of these numbers are going to be very large uh, because our small case K may be very large. And so in that case, you know, once you multiply G times a small case K, uh, it could be the case that our big K is pretty large too. All right, so that shows you more or less how um, the, I, the, the basic concept of how elliptic curve cryptography works. Uh, we're not going to go into any more detail on this, but there are, you know, entire courses on cryptography out there that spend a lot of time on elliptic curve, and I highly recommend um, the Coursera cryptography course uh, by Dan Bonet if you're interested in learning more about cryptography. So let's take a look at Bitcoin addresses. Uh, a Bitcoin address is a string of digits and characters that can be shared with anyone who wants to send you money. Addresses produced from public keys consist of a string of numbers and letters, beginning with the digit one. Uh, here's an example of a Bitcoin address, you know, one, J7, MD, G5, R, B, Q, Y, and so on. Um, the Bitcoin address is what appears most commonly in a transaction uh, as the recipient of the funds. You know, if you compare a Bitcoin transaction to a paper check, the Bitcoin address is the beneficiary, uh, you know, sort of what, which is what you write on the check is who's getting paid. On a paper check, that beneficiary can sometimes be the name of a bank account holder, but it could also include corporations, institutions, or even cash. Uh, because paper checks don't need to specify an account, but rather use an abstract name, 
as a recipient of funds. They can be very flexible payment instruments. Bitcoin transactions use a similar abstraction, which is the Bitcoin address, to make Bitcoin payments pretty flexible. A Bitcoin address can represent the owner of a private public key pair, or it can represent something else, such as a payment script, as we'll see when we talk about pay to script hash addresses. For now, let's examine the simple case, a, pay, a Bitcoin address that represents is derived from a public key. So the Bitcoin address is derived from the public key through the use of one-way cryptographic hashing. A hashing algorithm or a ha simply hash algorithm is a one-way function that produces a fingerprint or hash of an arbitrary sized input. Cryptographic hash functions are used extensively in Bitcoin, in Bitcoin addresses and script addresses, and in the mining proof of work algorithm. The algorithms used to make a Bitcoin address from a public key are the secure hash algorithm SHA-256 and the race integrity primitives evaluation message digest or RIPE-MD-160 algorithm. Starting with the public key K, we compute the SHA-6 hash and then compute the RIPE-MD hash of the 160 of that result, producing a 160-bit number. Um, Bitcoin addresses is, are not the same as a public key. Bitcoin addresses are derived from the public key using a one-way function, uh, similar to how we derive the public key from the private key using a one-way function. So here we've got this formula, address A equals RIPEMD160, and in parentheses we have SHAP-6, and in parentheses we have K. So we've got our public key, we put it in a SHA-2B6, we take the output from the SHA-2B6, which is a 256 bit number, put that in a ripe MD-160, and then take our 160 bit output from that, and that becomes our public key hash. We then uh, encode Bitcoin addresses using uh, base 58 check. So base 58 check is a formatting uh, mechanism to make uh, numbers, Bitcoin numbers easier to read. Uh, so it uses 58 characters and a checksum to help human readability, avoid ambiguity and protect against errors. Uh, base 50 check is also used in a number of other ways in Bitcoin. Whenever there's a need for a user to be able to read and correctly transcribe a number, such as an address, a private key, an encrypted key or a script hash. Um, So after you encode it with the base 58 check, then you have your Bitcoin address that uh, you can expose to the world. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. What's going on with this base 58? So in order to represent long numbers in a compact way using fewer symbols, many computer systems use mixed alphanumeric representations with a base or a radix higher than 10. Uh, for example, where the traditional decimal system uses a 10 numeral zero through nine, hexadecimal system uses 16, adding in letters A through F as six additional symbols in addition to zero through nine. Uh, a number represented in hexadecimal format is gonna be shorter than the equivalent decimal representation. Uh, even more compact, the base 64 representation uses 26 lowercase letters, 26 capital letters, 10 numerals and two more characters uh, to transmit binary data over text-based media such as email. Base 64 is most commonly used to add by, uh, add binary attachments to email. Base 58 is a text-based binary encoding format developed for use in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. It offers a balance between compact representation, readability, and error detection and prevention. Base 58 is a subset of, of Base 64 using upper and lowercase letters and numbers, but emitting characters that are frequently mistaken for one another and compare identical when displayed in certain form fonts. So for example, base 58 doesn't have the number zero, it doesn't have the capital O, it doesn't have the lowercase L, it doesn't have the capital I, and it doesn't have the special symbols, the two special symbols that base 64 has. Uh, so it's, so by having those 58 characters, you can put a lot of more information in there than you could in base 10 or in base 16 hexadecimal. Uh, to add extra security against typos, or transcription errors, base 58 check uh, is a base 58 encoding format frequently used in Bitcoin, which also has a built-in error checking code. 
The checksum is an additional four bytes added to the end of the data that's being encoded. Checksum is derived from the hash of the encoded data. It can therefore be used to detect and prevent transcription and typing errors. When presented with base 58 check code, the coding software will calculate the checksum of the data and compare it to the checksum including the code. If the two don't match, an error has been introduced and the base 58 check data is invalid. This should prevent a mistyped Bitcoin address from being accepted by the wallet software as a valid destination, an error that could otherwise result in loss of funds. To convert data into a base 58 check format, we're first going to add a prefix to the data called a version byte, uh, which serves to easily identify the type of data that's encoded. For example, in the case of a Bitcoin address, the prefix will be zero, whereas the prefix used when encoding a private key would be 128. Um, next, uh, we compute the double SHA checksum, meaning that we apply the SHA-36 hash algorithm twice in the previous result, um, and that is used here. So let's take a look at this diagram. You start off with a payload that we want to convert. Uh, you add the version prefix, you know, here will be one or zero or 128, depending on what we're doing. Then you have your payload, then you have, you, we're going to take um, the payload, we're going to hash it twice using two SHA-36, and then the output from the second one will drop everything except the first four bytes of that hash output. And those first four bytes become the checksum. Um, and then we're going to encode all this using base 58. And now this is base 58 check encoded payload. We've got a version prefix, we've got a checksum, and you've got your payload. So in Bitcoin, most of the data presented to the user is base 58 check encoded to make it compact, easy to read, and easy to detect errors. Uh, the version prefix in base 58 check encoding is used to create easily distinguishable formats, which when encoded in base 58 contains specific characters at the beginning of the base 58 check encoded payload. These characters make it easy for humans to identify the type of data that's encoded and how to use it. This is what differentiates, for example, a base 58 check encoded Bitcoin address that starts with one, from a base 58 check encoded private key uh, wallet in import format starts with a five. Uh, some example version prefixes and the resulting base 58 characters are shown on this table below. Where we get the address begins with a one, pay to script hash address is a three, test nets is M or N, private keys, uh, wallet import format is going to be five KRL, and then we've got some BIP38 and BIP32 key formats. So both private keys and public keys can be represented in a number of different formats. These representations all encode the same number, even though they look different. These formats are primarily used to make it easy for people to read and transcribe keys without introducing errors. So let's take a look at private key representations. The private keys can be represented in a number of different formats, all of which are different ways of displaying the same 256-bit number. You know, private key representations uh, show three, this table here shows several different uh, common formats used to represent private keys. Um, different formats are used in different circumstances. Hexadecimal and raw binary formats are used internally in software and rarely shown to the users. Uh, the wallet import format is used for import export of keys between wallets and will often be used alongside a QR code. Um, so we see here, you know, four different approaches. Again, remember raw is a special format that is being used by Bitcoin Core. So you've got a raw format that takes 32 bytes, uh, hex format, which is 64 hexadecimal digits, uh, a wallet import format, which is base 58 check, and a wallet import, import format compressed, which also has an, an encoding suffix. And so this is describing the format, and here is what those keys look like in those particular formats. So hexadecimal, again, you know, it's going to be one through zero and A through F. Uh, the wallet import format is right here, and the wallet import format compressed is a little bit longer. Um, you might ask, uh, why is the compressed format longer than the wallet import format? Um, and that's because this compressed format is actually talking about how 
is not talking about compression for the private key, and we're showing the private keys here, but it's actually talking about a special format that is used when you're compressing the public key. And so when you use the wallet import format compression with the public keys, the public keys get dramatically smaller, but the way they do that is they put a little extra space in the private key. And so they make the private key a little longer. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about how the uh, wallet import format works with public keys uh, in a subsequent lecture. So public keys are also presented in different ways. Usually it's either compressed or uncompressed public keys. So as we saw previously, the public key is at a point on the elliptic curve consisting of a pair of coordinates X and Y. Uh, is usually presented with the prefix 04 followed by two 256-bit numbers, one for the X coordinate of the point, the other for the Y coordinate. The prefix 04 is used to distinguish uncompressed public keys from compressed public keys beginning with a two or a three. Here's the public key generated by the private key uh, we were just looking at. Remember, we looked at three different formats of that private key, but they were all the same number. So all three of these is really describing the same exact private key. It's just a different format uh, to describe it. So now let's talk about what the public keys look like. So here is the public key as X and Y coordinates in the elliptic curve. Because remember, what we do is we take a generator point, we multiply it by I, uh, your private key, which is some number, and then we get a, a, an XY coordinate on the curve, and that is your public key. So here's the X coordinate, here's the Y coordinate. And again, these are very large numbers because it's a very large, uh, you're going to end up with a very large number. Uh, now, you could also describe this public key, instead of showing XY coordinates, just as a very large number. Uh, and basically here what they've done is they've taken the X coordinate and they've just appended the Y coordinate after it. So instead of having two separate numbers there, it's just X followed by Y is essentially what they're doing. And you can even see here, here is the 07CF. That's this right there. And the FO2889 is this right here after the 04. So this is just appending uh, and making it a really long number. You know, you could call it 04X value followed by Y value. Compressed public keys were introduced to Bitcoin to reduce the data size of transactions and conserve disk space on nodes and store the Bitcoin blockchain database. Because remember what's going on when we talk about Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to have a Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain has over 10,000 nodes that are all processing every single transaction. Um, so if we could cut down on data that's in a particular transaction, then you're going to cut down on the amount of work those nodes have to do, but you're also going to cut down on all the messages that those nodes have to pass between each other. And a lot of messages get passed to keep those 10,000 nodes in, in sync with each other. Um, so reducing anywhere you can reduce data, it's a good thing. So we just talked about the fact that a regular public key requires 520 bits. Basically, this prefix 04 and then all the X value and all the Y value. So it's a pretty long string. So what can we do to cut that down? You know, if you're multiplying that 520 bits by tens of thousands of transactions per day, that's a lot of data on the blockchain. It's a lot of data being passed through messages. It's a lot of computations that have to be done. Uh, we'd like to reduce the amount of data that has to be stored and spent and, and sent across the network. Well, if we know the X coordinate, we can solve, calculate the y coordinate by solving this equation here, uh, y squared mod p equals x cubed plus seven mod p. Now this particular equation, if you know x, does not take that long to compute. And so it doesn't really hurt the Bitcoin network to have our nodes computing it. And we actually will save a lot by doing this computation as opposed to actually sending the answer all across the network. So this way we can store only the x coordinate of the public key point, emitting the Y coordinate and reducing the size of the key and the space required to store it by 256 bits. Since we can just drop off this entire Y value, we'll just recompute it. So this is almost a 50% reduction in size in every transaction. It adds up to a lot of data saved over time. 
So whereas uncompressed public keys have a prefix of 04, you know, we showed it up here, um, 04XY, our compressed public keys are either gonna have 02 or 03 as a prefix based on whether the Y value is even or odd. And this even or odd Y value is gonna correspond to plus or minus. So what are we talking about here? We're basically talking about, if we go back to our elliptic curve, look at our elliptic curve here. If the Y value is up here, it's positive. The Y value is down here is negative. Um, and now, again, these are reflections. So um, we can compute the answer, but then we have to know whether it was a positive or a negative. So we go back to this formula. This formula here will tell us what the Y value is, but we need to know what the sign is for that computed Y value. And that, so we're gonna save the sign um, by specifying O2 for our compression here, if Y is even, i.e. positive, or we'll save O3 if, odd, if Y is odd, i.e. Uh, there's a negative sign. So that's the basic idea. Uh, so this compressed pu public key corresponds uh, to, you know, what, uh, our full size uh, public key, but it saves us a lot of space. So compressed public keys are gradually becoming the default across Bitcoin clients, and it's having a significant impact on reducing the size of transactions and the blockchain. However, not all clients uh, support compressed public keys because there's a lot of different clients being run on the Bitcoin blockchain. So newer clients that support compressed public keys have to account for transactions from older clients that don't support compressed public keys. That's especially important when a wallet application is importing private keys from another Bitcoin wallet application because a new wallet needs to scan the blockchain to find transactions corresponding to the imported keys which Bitcoin addresses should the wallet scan for? So the Bitcoin addresses produced by uncompressed public keys or the Bitcoin addresses produced by compressed Bitcoin public keys. Both are valid Bitcoin addresses and can be signed by the, pri by the private key with their different addresses. So, so to resolve this issue, when private keys are exported from a wallet, the wallet import format that is used to represent them is implemented differently to indicate that compressed private keys have been used to produce compressed public keys and therefore compressed Bitcoin addresses. That allows the importing wallet to distinguish between private keys originating from older and newer wallets and search the blockchain for transactions with Bitcoin addresses corresponding to the uncompressed or compressed public keys. And so that's why we saw earlier, we had that compressed private key format that doesn't really compress the private key format uh, because when a private key is exposed as a width compressed, exported as width compressed, it's actually a little bit longer than uncompressed private key because uh, really we're just adding the one byte suffix to it, uh, which signifies the private keys from a newer wallet and should only be used to produce compressed public keys. Uh, private keys are themselves not compressed and can't be compressed. Um, so it really just means when you hear compressed private key, that it means a private key from which uh, compressed public keys should be derived. Uh, whereas uncompressed private keys just mean a private key uh, from which uncompressed public keys should be derived. So again, here is a look at uh, what the private keys look like again. And our compressed version is very similar to our uncompressed version, except it's got an extra byte there. You know, for example, in hex format, uh, we got an extra 01 as our suffix at the end of the hex compressed for the width uh, format, uh, you know, you've got a number of extra characters at the end of it. Now, if a Bitcoin wallet is able to implement compressed public keys, it's going to use them uh, in all future transactions. The private keys in the wallet will be used to derive the public key points on the curve, which will then be compressed. Compressed public keys will be used to produce a Bitcoin addresses, and those will be used in transactions. Uh, and when exporting private keys from a new wallet that implements compressed public keys, the wallet import format will be modified with that one byte suffix. So one that you can see here. Um, 
Now you can implement keys and addresses in a number of different programming languages, as we talked about in our lecture on uh, Bitcoin Core. I'm not going to go through it, but obviously you can use Python, C++, Java, in Perl, and many other programming languages. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, some other types of addresses. Let's talk about pay to script hash. So as I mentioned earlier, traditional Bitcoin addresses begin with the number one and are derived from the public key, which is derived from the private key. And you know anyone can send Bitcoin to a one address, but that Bitcoin can only be spent by presenting the corresponding public private key signature and the public key. Bitcoin addresses that begin with a number three though, are pay to script hash addresses. They designate the beneficiary of Bitcoin transaction as a hash of a script instead of at the owner of a public key. Um, the Bitcoin script hash or P2SH, um, you know, provides additional functionality to addresses. Unlike transactions that send funds to a one address, also known as a P2PKH or pay to public key hash, uh, funds sent to these three addresses require something more than the presentation of one public key and one private key signature as proof of ownership of the funds. Uh, the requirements are designated at the time the address is created within a script and all inputs to the address will be encumbered with the requirements of the script. So a pay to SH uh, address is created from a transaction script, which defines who can spend a transaction output. Uh, encoding the P2SH address involves using the same uh, double hash functions as used during creation of Bitcoin address, only applied on the script instead of on the public key. The resulting script hash, uh, so here we see a, a ripe MD160 around SHA-36 around script. Uh, so the resulting script hash is encoded with base 58 check with version prefix of five, which results in this encoded address starting with three. An example of a P2SH address would again be base 58 starting with three. And P2SH is not the same as a multi-signature standard transaction, although many multi-signature transactions are popular P2SH addresses. Uh, currently, the most common implementation of the P2SH function is a multi-signature address script. Uh, as the name implies, the underlying script requires a minimum number of signatures, provide ownership, and therefore spend funds. Uh, the Bitcoin multi-signature feature is designed to require M signatures, also known as a threshold, from a total of N keys, sometimes referred to as an M of N multi-sig, where M is equal to or less than N. For example, um, you know, Bob, the coffee shop owner, could use a multi-signature address requiring one or two signatures from a key belonging to him and his spouse, either allowing either of them to sign a transaction uh, that's, and, oh, and spend funds that were sent to that address. This can be similar to a joint account implemented in traditional banking where either spouse can spend with a single signature. Or there might be a, a business transaction where you might create a two or three multi-signature address uh, that ensures no funds can be spent until at least two out of three business partners sign a transaction. Vanity addresses are valid Bitcoin addresses that contain human readable messages. Uh, for example, on the screen here, we've got one love, uh, BPZZs, whatever. Um, you know, basically forming the word love as our first uh, four base 58 letters. Uh, vanity addresses require generating and testing large numbers of candidate private keys until a Bitcoin address with the desired pattern is found. Although there are some optimizations in the vanity generation algorithm process essentially involves picking a private key at random, computing the public key, computing the Bitcoin address, and then checking to see if the address matches the desired vanity pattern uh, and repeating it as many times as necessary until a match is found, perhaps billions of times. Once a vanity address matches the desired pattern, the private key from which it was computed can be used by the owner to spend Bitcoin in exactly the same way as any other address. Vanity addresses aren't any less or more secure than any other address. They depend on the same elliptic curve cryptography and SHA-26 hashing as any other address. 
you can no more easily find the private key of an address starting with a vanity pattern than you can find any other address. Let's suppose that uh, we want to create a, a vanity address that begins with kids. Um, so the search for a pattern like kids could be viewed as searching, um, you know, for an address that um, is ki kid one kids. Uh, it starts with one because again, Bitcoin addresses start with one, then kids, and then whatever string comes after it. We don't really care. And so you can say to yourself, you know, there's approximately 6,000 possibilities of, you know, addresses that would begin with kids and then would have, uh, rain, uh, you know, some string of numbers and characters after that. Out of potentially a massive number of potential addresses. And so the question is, how long would it take us to compute a solution in here that begins with kids? And this table here shows us how long. Um, so if we, we, we're going for a length of four, uh, we don't count the one here. So for length of four is just KIDS. It would call, take us approximately, we'd have to do, it's one in 11 million uh, is how many uh, uh, solutions we would get. So basically you create 11 million Bitcoin uh, addresses and one of them should begin with those kids on average. Now, it might take you more than 11 million, it might take you less. Uh, and on average, the search time should be about a minute of uh, using a modern computer. Uh, now, if you want to create a much longer string, let's say kids charity, uh, this is 11 characters instead of four. And instead of one minute, it should take uh, two and a half million years. Um, now, again, this is using uh, a modern PC uh, using today's technology. Um, our technology may get much faster in the future, um, in which case you might be able to compute uh, a vanity address much quicker. Uh, furthermore, if you're using more powerful machines or machines were specifically designed to uh, perform Bitcoin proof of work, it might be significantly faster. Uh, another way to find a vanity address is to outsource the work to a pool of miners. Uh, and a pool of miners like that might charge you a certain amount to use their mining machines to compute the vanity address. Now, one thing to keep in mind is uh, vanity addresses also make it possible for anyone to create an address that resembles uh, any random address or even another vanity address, thereby potentially fooling your customers. So for example, let's suppose I have a e-commerce store and I put on my e-commerce store um, an address of JSA7MDG5RB for people to send me Bitcoin. A hacker might decide to hack my website and replace my J7MDG5R with this J7MD1Q. Or maybe they want to create a little closer, so they put in a five-character match or a six-character match. Uh, and it doesn't take the hacker very long to generate one of those matches. Uh, and then they hope that no one will notice that they've updated my website with their own Bitcoin address instead of mine. So one of the risks of using a single fixed address rather than a separate dynamic address for uh, someone sending in money is that a thief might be able to infiltrate your website, if replace it with their own address, and divert the, uh, the money to themselves. So let's talk about paper wallets. Paper wallets are Bitcoin private keys printed on paper. Often the paper wallet also includes corresponding Bitcoin address for convenience, but this is not necessary because it can be derived from the private key. Uh, however, something to keep in mind is paper wallets are an obsolete technology and they are dangerous for most users. I'm going to explain what they are so you understand what they are and you understand some of the drawbacks. Um, and there are many subtle pitfalls involved in generating paper wallets and in using them. So while it's okay to use them, uh, I would be very careful and I would not deliberately go out of my way to use them. Um, you know, and it's possible, hundreds of Bitcoin have been stolen from paper wallets. 
So if you do have a paper wallet, I would recommend moving your Bitcoin off your paper wallet into either a software or a hardware paper wallet, uh, uh, hardware wallet. And in fact, I recommend hardware wallets for storing Bitcoin and keys uh, as they're much more secure than paper wallets. Uh, paper wallets come in a number of different shapes, sizes, and designs, but at a very basic level, they're just a key and an address printed on paper. So here is a very simple paper wallet. Uh, you've got your address, you've got your private key. There you go. If this is on paper, um, and you know, it's 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 an address and a private key. You can use the ad give the address to other people to send you cryptocurrency. And when you want to spend that cryptocurrency, you can use this private key to uh, create digital signatures to spend the private key, the, the cryptocurrency. Here is another example of a paper wallet. Uh, this one has a QR code uh, associated with the uh, <coughs> the address and the private key. We can see over on the left, we have our address, our Bitcoin address that begins with the number one, one E, whatever. And this QR code is a QR code of the address. And then when you want to spend the Bitcoin, you've got a private key over here and you've got a QR code associated with the private key. Now, some of these paper wallets were originally designed as gifts. Uh, some of them were designed to be uh, given away at conferences and events, um, and they wanted to make it easy. Some of them have like stickers over the private keys. So you have to scratch off the sticker before you can see the QR code and what the private key value is, or maybe they're folded and sealed with tamper-proof adhesive foil. Um, other designs give you multiple copies of the key and the address. Uh, for example, here we've got multiple copies of the keys and the address. Um, you've got a private key and a copy of the private key, a copy of the public key and the public key over there. Um, one of the reasons why people would uh, create multiple paper keys uh, was to have multiple copies that you could store in different places uh, and for backup purposes. Uh, now, again, as I mentioned earlier, most of this uh, paper wallet technology is obsolete. I, I instead highly recommend using a modern hardware wallet, which we will talk about in our next lecture. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for attending this lecture where we went through cryptography and keys, elliptic curve cryptography, Bitcoin addresses, advanced keys, and paper wallets. Um, and I would also like to thank Andreas uh, Antonopoulos uh, for his uh, Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site, which some of the slides in this deck are based on. Um, this slide deck, the GitHub Mastering Bitcoin site, and any other content based on these slides uh, are covered by a Crypto Creative Commons uh, share alike license, uh, which you can find at the URL here. Thanks again for watching this video. Uh, this was. Uh, Bitcoin keys and addresses, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. And my next lecture is going to dive into wallet technology. See you then.